Section 1 of Dave Brings Home a Wife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dave Brings Home a Wife by Steel Rudd. Narrated by Beth Thomas. Dad Rudd. Australian farmer, patriarch of the Rudd clan. Read by Son of the Exiles. Mother Rudd, wife of Dad Rudd. Read by T.J. Burns. Dave Rudd, son of Dad Rudd, newly married. Read by Thomas Peter. Sarah Rudd, daughter of Dad Rudd. Read by Linda Olsen Fytak. Lily, newly married to Dave. Read by Devora Allen. Lily's mother. Dave's mother in law. Read by Sonia. Joe, son of Dad Rudd. Read by Nima. Bill. Son of Dad Rudd. Read by phone. Barty. Son of Dad Rudd. Read by Peter Musgrove. Jimmy Regan. Neighbour to the Rudds. Read by Todd. Young Regan. Neighbour to the Rudds. Read by Zoe Trang. Willie Wiley. Orphan boy adopted by one of Dad's neighbours. Read by phone. Mary Murphy. Daughter of one of Dad's neighbours. Read by Leanne Yao. The Parson read by Larry Wilson. Mrs. Walker, read by Sandra Schmidt. Building Contractor, read by Larry Wilson. Chapter 10. Dave Brings Home a Wife. All was joy and merriment at Rudville. There was no grumbling, no dissension, no dissatisfaction of any kind. Even Dad took things cheerfully and became frisky and light-hearted as a fat lamb. The longest days seemed short hours, and home was simply heaven. Dave was the cause of all the love and felicity. Dave got married and brought his wife home to live with us. A fine wife she was too, a slim, jolly girl with red hair. Lily White was her name, and we took a great liking to her. So did Dave. Lots of young fellows down at Prosperity had tried hard to win Lily, but she rejected them all with contumely. Dave thought all the more of her on that account. The welcome we gave to Lily when she arrived seemed to add twenty years to Dave's life. Our display of affection quite overpowered him, swelled his breast with gratitude, and filled his eyes with tears as large as hailstones. All of us, except Bill and Tom and me, met them at the gate and kissed Lily freely. We hesitated when it came to hugging her, but Sarah shoved us forward and said, Ain't you going to kiss Lily? She's your sister now. Then we took courage and waded in, though we wouldn't have hugged Sarah herself for a fortune unless it was on the solemn assurance that she was going far from home and would never return. After us, Dad stepped forward. Well, he said, removing his hat to expedite the performance. If she be your sister, she be my daughter. And he commenced vigorously where we had left off. When Dad finished with Lily, Sarah took possession of her and hugged her again and put an arm around her waist and conducted her up the veranda steps into Dave's little room, where she took her hat off for her and kissed her some more and showed her the newly papered walls, papered for her special comfort, and a new bed curtain and draping and a coloured pincushion and a pair of flower vases and a wardrobe and other knick-knacks and pieces of furniture which Sarah had robbed her own room of to surprise Lily with and make her happy. And Lily was happy. She sat on the bed and said so. She spoke fondly of Dave, too. It was hard parting with Mother, she murmured. But I don't mind when I know I have a good husband. And tears came into her eyes, and Sarah kissed them away and said, No one knows it better than I do, dear. He was always my favourite brother. Which was a fib, because Sarah always reckoned Dave a nuisance and never tired of wishing him married. She seemed to think that a wife was the worst infliction she could wish on Dave. Then Sarah broke into tears and Lily kissed them away. They're my sister, she said, and changed the subject. She turned it onto Sarah's future and they became very confidential. Sarah smiled happily at Lily and said that she couldn't say for certain when it was to be. It might be at Easter 12 months or the following Christmas. It all depended. But Lily wasn't to mention it to a soul, not even to Dave. And when Lily had given her solemn word not to divulge the secret, they kissed each other again and said, We're sisters now forever. Then they returned to the veranda, where Mother and Dad and the rest of us were trying to entertain Dave. But Dave was a hard bridegroom to entertain. He didn't hear a word we had to say to him. Thought you was lost, he said, eagerly grabbing Lily by the arm and leading her inside to sit on the sofa. 
Four weeks passed, and home was merrier than ever, and Lily and Dave were as happy-looking as a garden. Dave was proud of his Lily. He rarely ever left her side. Lily knew the run of the house too now, and understood our ways and addressed us all by our Christian names, and called Dad Father. Lily was never untidy either, and always came to her meals in a neat dress, and sat beside Dave with a buttercup in her hair. And she would talk cheerfully all the time, and point out resemblances between Mother's eyes and Dave's, or Dad's nose and Bill's. Lily was an observant young woman. In the afternoons, Sarah would take Lily for a walk. Often they would go down to the paddock and keep Dave company till nearly tea time. On other occasions they would go visiting together, and sometimes they would ride to the store or to the railway station. And Sarah would give her side saddle to Lily and ride in a man's saddle herself. Sarah was fond of Lily. She couldn't do half enough for her. And Lily loved Sarah. Mother said she never knew two young people to be so devoted to each other. And Dad reckoned it was fortunate for Dave that Sarah wasn't Joe. Four more weeks elapsed. Sarah and Lily were not so fond of each other now. They didn't go anywhere together at all. Somehow they avoided one another. And Lily would go down to the paddock alone and remain with Dave till he knocked off work. Mealtimes, too, lost all their cheerfulness. All the good fellowship had gone from them. There was scarcely any conversation carried on at the table, and Sarah was nearly always absent from it. While we were eating, she would be working and banging things about in the kitchen. Sometimes Dad would miss her, and looking up at Mother, he would ask, Where's Sarah? And Mother would change colour and mumble a clumsy apology, which would make Lily fidget and look along her nose. And frequently Lily would refuse a second cup of tea, which she was badly in the need of, and leave the table before she had finished, and with Dave at her heels would retire to her room. But Dad was not a man to notice little things, and sometimes he would add with a yell, Well, why the devil doesn't she come and get her tea? Dave and Lily isolated themselves, spent a lot of time in their room, and we wondered what was the matter. We couldn't make it out, and Joe asked Sarah one night what it was all about. Sarah, who had her sleeves rolled up making bread, dug her fists deep in the dough and said, Be sure the little cat. Then she turned the dough over and slapped it down hard on the table and punched it with her other fist. Joe chuckled and said he could never understand why women couldn't agree. Could you agree with anyone? Sarah snapped. Who expects you to do all the cooking and washing and slaving and to run about and clean up after them while they sit down and up the lady? That's nothing, Joe said flippantly. Joe enjoyed Sarah when she was angry. Oh, isn't it nothing? And Sarah leaned on the dough with both hands and glared at him after the manner of Dad. Then let her do it if it isn't. I'm not going to stay here and scrub and wash her dirt for her any more. That's one thing. Anyway, the least she might do is to clean out her own room and make her own bed of a morning instead of titivating herself as soon as she gets up, scenting herself too, and donning her old red hair to come out and sit down to breakfast as if she was Lady Muck or somebody. And Sarah waded into the bread again. Joe grinned some more and said, You're jealous, Sal. Jealous? What of? Sarah fired up. Of that cat with her red hair? Pooh. If it was mine, I'd get some lump black and change its colour. Joe went away smiling, and Dave, with a warlike look on his face, entered the kitchen. Dave was looking for a fight. Sarah didn't look at Dave. Any matches here? Dave asked, manoeuvring for an opening. There's some there. Sarah jerked out, walloping the dough as though it were a carpet. Dave glanced around the room for a second or two, then rested his eyes on Sarah. What have you been doing to Lily? He drawled at last. Who says I've been doing anything to Lily? And Sarah flashed her big eyes on Dave. Well, I know you insulted her. Dave replied. Well, if asking her to do her own dirty work is insulting her. Sarah snorted, facing Dave with a big cake of dough in her hand. Then I did. And I'll do it again. And what's more, you can tell us so. You're very funny. Dave sneered and walked out. Dave was no match for Sarah in a row. Dave went across to the barn where the husking was being carried on by lamplight and confided his troubles to Dad, and in the interests of peace, suggested building a house for himself. Leave him alone, Dad said. 
Don't take any notice of them. They're all the same. I'll drive you mad if you do. Dad didn't look upon the idea of building another house with favour. Dad never approved of ideas that cost money, and for the time being, Dave took his advice. But one evening, when loud screams issued from the house and we all stampeded from the milking yard and found Sarah mauling and clawing Lily and trailing her about over the backs of chairs, matters were brought to a head. It's not a bit of good. Dave moaned to Dad after peace was restored. I must have a house of my own, or else I'll clear out and look for work somewhere else. Well, Dad answered slowly, I'll see if I can't get you a bit of timber somewhere and put you one up. Then realising to what length he had committed himself in the way of expenditure, he exclaimed, Dash the women! They're always fighting about something or other! After tea, Dad sat on the veranda and cooled down and ruminated for a long time. Then he called Dave and Joe together and discussed the position with them. There were a house down on that old farm of Grogan's, Dad said. Is that there yet? Some of it's standing, Dave drawled, and Joe remarked with a chuckle that he was once... (laughs) Nearly putting it on the dray and bringing it home for a calf pen. Tut, tut. Not at all. Not at all. Dad said in disapproval. That were a snug little place when Greg and lived there first. Forty-five year ago, believe me. Forty-five year ago? From Dave, Joe chuckled again. Yes. Dad said sententiously. I don't think it's any older than that. Let me see. He made a mental calculation in the dark. Yes, no, yes. No, it's not more than 42. (laughs) Just about time for the sap to dry. Joe sniggered. When it's pulled down and trimmed up a bit with the ads and put up again. Dad went on enthusiastically. It'll look a different place. It'll look just as well as this, believe me. But you want some new timber. Dave put in anxiously. Well, yes, maybe. Dad grunted. But not much, you'll find, not much. There's a lot of material in that house when you come to go over it all. I remember it well. Then he said he would go with the dray in the morning and bring the building home. And that night Dave and Lily went to bed in a happy mood and lay awake for hours evolving and discussing plans and specifications for their new home. End of section one. Section 2 of Dave Brings Home a Wife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dave Brings Home a Wife by Steel Rudd. Chapter 11 Dave's New House. Dad kept faith with Dave, and accompanied by Bill and Cranky Jack, went with the dray to remove the house that was on Grogan's abandoned selection. It was an easy house to knock down, what was standing of it, but it was tedious work gathering it all up, and a lot of it was hard to find. The building in its old age had become dislocated, got away from itself, and lay scattered here and there in the long grass like the bones of a dead beast. The two doors and the window were missing altogether, and their absence gave Dad a lot of anxiety. "'Wonder what the devil's become of them," he said, after searching the paddock for hours in vain. "'I should be here somewhere.' but Bill fancied there never were any. He couldn't remember having seen them, and he'd often been in the old house, got wet under its roof many a time when seeking shelter in it from the rain. Rubbish! Dad snorted. Don't I recollect the place long before any of you was born? Forty-two years ago I stayed in it a night with a grogan, and there was two good doors to it then, and a window in front made of sawn timber. I remember them well. They're not here now, anyway, Bill answered, concluding the argument and approaching the loaded dray. If I could get the hinges, Dad murmured, rooting up the remains of an ancient fire with the toe of his boot. Wouldn't matter so much. And easily knock up a door or two. Dad had to abandon the search and start home with the dray. Dad made two trips to Grogan's, and when he arrived with the second load, Dave, who had just come in for dinner, visited the scene of action to give a hand to unload. Well, what do you think of it? 
Dad asked cheerfully, as he arranged the timber on the ground according to the lengths. Pretty old, some of it, Dave replied, staring hard at the pile of rubbish. Old? Dad answered. Why, bless my soul, it's all the better for that. It's your green timber that's the ruin of half the houses, man. I'd never dream of building a place out of green timber myself. Look at Daly's place. Nearly every slab in it is tumbling out. I've got that short you could put your head between some of them. And when it was put up first, I don't suppose there was a better fitted house in the country. And it's all because the timber was green. Dave pointed to a corner post that was mostly eaten away, out of the pulpy remains of which grass was growing luxuriantly. That only wants a bit of Adson, Dad said. And you'll find it as sound as a bell. Dave was doubtful. Don't air, he drawled. Certain of it, Dad answered, plucking some of the grass from the post. Just upend it and feel the weight. But Dave's eyes had wandered to several slabs with large holes mortised in them, and slices burnt off the ends and edges of them, and he stooped and turned one over. Well, yes, Dad admitted reluctantly. I've been knocked about a bit. Some fool of a traveller, no doubt. He went on in explanation. Has been letting his fire burn too near him. But they'll come in handy, you'll find. They'll do very well for the partition, with a bit of paper put over them holes. No one will ever see them. Dad didn't believe in carting timber three or four miles just to throw it away. Next day, Dave suggested giving a hand to erect the house. Dave was anxious it should be built according to the plans and specifications he and Lily had decided upon, but Dad wouldn't hear of it. Leave it to me, he said, and you get on with the ploughing. I know exactly the sort of house she wants, and I'll make a good job of it, believe me. Then Bill and Dad searched for the crowbar, and when they had given the axe and the adze a touch-up on the grindstone, the new house started to go up. It went on going up, and coming down, for weeks. Dad used to come down with it too sometimes. He came down along with a lot of it one day, and lay under the ridgepole till Bill stopped laughing and extricated him. Then Dad cursed Bill for not... Watching it properly. And they fell out, and Bill was ordered off the job. Bill went cheerfully, and Dad put Barty on in his place. But Barty did not turn out a success. Barty had never been engaged on a building before, and had no confidence in himself. He had no confidence in Dad either. He was afraid of Dad, and became confused and did the wrong thing whenever Dad shouted at him. And Barty was no good unless someone did shout at him. And he hadn't been twenty minutes on the job when Dad, mounted on the wall, said, pointing the hammer, Hand me that button. There were a dozen or so lying about. Barty was anxious to please Dad, and with rare alacrity handed him the wrong baton. No, no. And Dad wagged his head impatiently. The other one behind you. They were all behind Barty. Barty dropped the baton he had in his hand and seized another and poked the end of it hurriedly at Dad. Damn it! Dad yelled. Why can't you look where I'm pointing? There! You're standing on it! Barty's foot covered three or four battens. Dropping the second baton, Barty pointed to another. This one, then? He whined. Yes, that's the one! Dad roared. It's big enough to see, ain't it? Barty snatched up another. No, confound it, no! Dad howled. The other one! That one! and he let fly the hammer viciously at the baton he required and struck Barty hard on the foot. Ooh, ooh, wah. Barty suddenly bellowed and danced round the heap of timber on one leg. Well, why the devil didn't you keep your eyes open? Dad growled. Ooh, ooh. Barty blubbered in a lower key, placing the toe of the maimed foot lightly to the ground and breaking into a limp. Damn it! From Dad. Am I going to have to stand here all day? Hand me back that hammer and stop your hopping about. Ooh. And Barty, lifting the tool, stood with it in his hand, staring up in terror at Dad. Hand me that hammer! Dad fairly yelled. Ooh. Barty shuddered. Do you hear? From Dad, louder than ever. You'll hit me with it. Ooh. Dad let out another howl and started to descend, and Barty, forgetting his injured limb, turned and fled. He also forgot to leave the hammer. Dad followed in pursuit. Where is he? He yelled, stamping through our house. Where the devil? 
Good day, Mr. Rudd. It was the soft voice of the parson that spoke. He had dropped in on his rounds and was enjoying a cup of tea along with Mother and Lily in the sitting room. Oh, Dad jerked out, stopping abruptly. It's you. And the parson rose and warmly shook hands with Dad and asked him if he was enjoying good health. And Mother, taking advantage of the opportunity to calm Dad, asked him to have a cup of tea. Before Dad could answer, Lily jumped to her feet to hand him the beverage and revealed the terrified form of Barty crouching behind her chair. You dog! Dad roared, his eyes ablaze with anger. But Barty sprang behind the parson and clung to the tails of his long black coat and ducked from side to side, sparring for a chance to make a dash for the open door. The door was behind Dad. You tinker! Dad howled, grabbing round one side of the astonished cleric for a grip of Barty, and kicking out on the other side of him whenever Barty dodged that way. Dear me, calm yourself, calm yourself, Mr. Rudd, the parson exclaimed, holding up his two hands in front of Dad to implore peace, while Mother called, Father, don't be foolish. But Dad was bent on securing some of Barty at any cost, and aimed another heavy circular kick at him, and bruised the parson's shins. The parson dropped his hands and screwed his face about and cried, Good gracious me. Oh, keep out of the way, then. Dad foamed apologetically into the clergyman's ear. Or I can't help hurting you. Then the parson thought it wise to free himself of Barty and made an effort to desert. But Barty kept a firm grip of his coat and used it as a lever to keep him in position. At last, Dad's wrath overcame his judgment and in his haste he stumbled forward against the table and gave Barty an opening. Barty flashed through the door like a wallaby, and Dad made a late kick at him and fell heavily on the floor and rattled the crockery in the kitchen. Dear, oh dear, oh dear, the parson said angrily, and Dad roared, You imp of a fella, and rose and hobbled after Barty, but he might just as well have remained on the floor. Next day, Joe joined Dad, and between them, Joe rattling the hammer on the roof of the new house, and Dad belting slabs into position with the back of the axe. They kept up a great noise. You'd think they were building the federal capital. Occasionally, Dad, with the axe on his shoulder, would stand some yards off from the building to take observations, just as he would when making a haystack. How does she look? Joe would ask, and Dad would answer, Capital. It'll be a neat little place when it's finished. Then he'd walk around it and add splinters from the walls and ram the loose earth tight against the foot of the slabs with the heel of his boot. Frequently, the neighbours passing by would ride in through the gate and ask Dad what it was he was putting up, and Dad would tell them and ask what they thought of it and invite them to look through it. Most of them smiled and thought it a very nice place. At least, that's what they told Dad. But young Regan rode in one day and sat on his horse and grinned disparagingly at the new house. Well, Dad said sulkily, what the devil's the matter with you? Dad had no love for the Regans. I was just wondering, young Regan answered, if there was anything the matter with you, and if this is a private asylum you're putting up for yourself to get into when it's finished. Look here! And Dad rushed round in search of a baton, but young Regan had gone before he could secure one from the pile. Dave and Lily came along one evening, and Dad put down the axe and showed them over the place. Lily looked inside and stared at the grass on the ground floor and the large holes burnt in the partition and said nothing. Most young wives go into raptures over their first new house, exaggerate its beauty and do their best to make others believe it's a grander place than the architect meant it to be. But Lily wasn't one of those. She hadn't much enthusiasm in her at all. Dad, though, discoursed volubly about it. A strong-built little place, he said, walking from one room to the other. There were two rooms in the new house. And every bit of it's well nailed, all new nails too, and it'll be a queer storm that ships it, believe me. These holes are nothing, he went on, putting his foot through one in the partition and looking at Lily. Paste a bit of paper over him, or... His enthusiasm increased. You can put the safe there, and no one'll ever see them. You'll never know they're there yourself after a while. And Dad smiled in admiration of his own originality. But won't there be any floorboards at all? Lily murmured with a sickly look at Dave, who was standing gloomily beside her. Dave looked at Dad. It'll all be done in good time, Dad said encouragingly. But you can't do everything at once. All the best houses round the district had ground floors in them when they were first put up. And... 
he added, tramping the floor hard with both feet. This is very solid here, firm as a rock. And when the grass comes off and there's a little sand and cow dung put on, I'll mix a bucketful to show you how it's done. It'll be as good as any boards, every bit and better. Lily made an effort to say something, but a lump seemed to stick in her throat. Emma fine slabs, Dad rattled on, drawing Dave's attention to the walls. There's no timber to be got in the country like that nowadays. Must be eighteen inches wide, them slabs. Proceeding to span one with his big hand. Fully that, he concluded. If not more. Dave didn't say anything. Dad didn't give him an opportunity. Now then, Dad continued, turning to the end of the building. What about a fireplace? You gonna have one, or will we put up a place outside in front for you to cook under? And he looked hard at Lily. Oh... Lily whined feebly, clutching Dave by the shirt sleeve. We must have a fireplace. Well, Dad said advisingly. We're not always an advantage, you know. In summer they make a room that up there's no living in a place where there's one. And when the westerly winds are blowing in the winter, the smoke from some of them would drive a man cranky. I'd never have one in a house myself if I were building again. Oh, what would be the good of it without a fireplace? Lily whined again, appealing to Dave. Very well, then. Very well, then. Dad put in. It's you that'll have to put up with it. Not me. I think it would be better. Dave drawled, supporting Lily's idea. All right, all right. Dad said, frowning. Oh, look what timber there is, and if there's enough, we'll see about it. Dad did look some days after, but there wasn't enough timber. After walking round the outside of the house in silence, Lily and Dave turned away from it as if it were a morgue they had been inspecting, and left in silence. When about fifty yards off, they turned and took another look at it. I thought it was to be a different place to that, Lily moaned. And no veranda on it either. Then she started to cry and said she would be ashamed to take anyone to such an ugly den. Dave began to wake up. Well... If you don't think you will like it, Lil, he said, finding some courage, I'll go back and tell him to knock it down. I ain't afraid to say so. No, no, Lily answered, wiping her eyes hurriedly. I don't mind now. I don't care a bit. It'll do. But we'll get a better one soon, won't we? Ah, he can't get out of it, Dave drawled. Ah, oh, he's weird for it. Lily was satisfied and clung lovingly to Dave's arm and walked on smiling. But Lily didn't know Dad then. She knows him a lot better now. At last the house was finished, and Dad gathered up the tools one evening and said, Yeah, they can go into it now as soon as they like. Then Dave and Lily pulled down their bed and collected all the miscellaneous pieces of furniture and pots and pans and things about the place which Mother said she didn't want, and a good many things she didn't say anything at all about, and left us and took possession of their new home. End of section two. Section three of Dave Brings Home a Wife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dave Brings Home a Wife by Steele Rudd. Chapter twelve. Dave and Lily start housekeeping. Dave and Lily, when they shifted into their new house, didn't give a ball or a party of any kind to commemorate the occasion. They didn't believe in wasting money. They went straight to work and put up the bed and arranged the odd pieces of furniture they had gathered and annexed from our place. Then they sat down and wiped the perspiration off themselves and looked at one another across the table and silently contemplated their new surroundings. We've no rations in yet, Lily said after a while. Or I'd put a fire on and make you a cup of tea. Then Dave strolled down to Mother, it was nearly a quarter of a mile from Dave's house to ours, and procured some tea and sugar and a bottle of melon jam and a supply of bread and meat, which he carried back in a flour sack, and dumped down on the table. There you are, he said. Make your tea and we'll have a feed. Hardly a day passed but what Dave made several trips to our place in quest of something or other. If it wasn't meat or a jug of milk or the loan of a dish for Lily to bake something in that he came for, it would be for a few potatoes or a clothes prop or the axe to cut a bit of wood with. In fact, every article for use or consumption that they required, Dave came to us for the loan of, 
even to Bill's bridle and Joe's saddle, until there was scarcely anything to be found at our place at all. Confound the fellow! Dad used to break out when he'd find the hammer or the axe was missing. Why the devil doesn't he bring the things back? Then he would yell for Barty, and Barty would trudge up to Dave's place and ask Dave if he had the axe. Yes. Dave would draw from the sofa, where he'd be employed studying an Australian songbook. It's out there, ain't it? Near the wood heap? Barty would carefully search for the wood heap first, then for the axe, and finally call out, Tain't anywhere here. He's not here at all, then, Dave would answer, with calm indifference, and proceed to spell over more songs. But Lily, who had a good memory, would recollect having seen it over near the tree. The tree was about a hundred yards off and in loud, shrill tones would inform Barty of its whereabouts. Dave would then remember where it was too. Yes, he would call out. That's where it is. But bring it back when you've done with it. I want it again. He wants it again. Barty would murmur when delivering the axe to Dad, and Dad would snort. Damn him! To the juice with him! Let him get an axe of his own. Often Lily would require a few things for the house, and she'd come along herself and borrow them from Mother. Frequently it was a needle she would require, the one she had was broke, or perhaps it would be a bit of black cotton to patch Dave's dark trousers with. She always had a good supply of white cotton. Sometimes she had two reels of it, ours and her own. And whenever Lily would come, Sarah would never show out. But when she was gone again, Sarah would emerge from one of the rooms and say to Mother, What in the name of goodness is she after now? That's the third time this morning. Just a little black thread, that's all, Mother would answer kindly. She's mending Davy's dark tweeds. Then Sarah would snigger. And isn't it nearly time? A's been going about with a big tear in those trousers, I'm sure, for the last fortnight. A thing he never can say he had to do when he was here. I never noticed it, Mother would put in, seeking to excuse Lily. And he was here with him on only yesterday. No, of course you didn't. And Sarah would grin wickedly. He had his coat on. Sarah had a good eye for seeing things. But it was humping water that kept Dave more in touch with our place than anything else. Dave was always coming for water. When he wasn't coming for a bucket of water, he was marching off with one. The bucket was rarely out of Dave's hand. But he might have saved himself a good many trips, though, if he had had a method. But there was never anything methodical about Dave. The wonder is Dave ever was born. Twice a day, when coming in for dinner, and after knocking off at night, he would walk right through our place to get a drink at the tank, and after gulping two or three pints, he'd proceed leisurely home, then come back for a bucketful for Lily. Rarely did we ever sit down to a meal without hearing someone at the tap, and we always knew it was Dave getting a bucket of water. Dad used to wonder what Dave wanted so much water for. Confound it! He'd sometimes growl. He'll have the tank empty soon. Why the deuce doesn't he go to the well? The well was only about a mile and a half away too, but Dave never went near it. Somehow he'd rather draw on us for the last drop of our water than make one trip to the well. Now and again, Lily would give Dave a spell at humping water and come herself with a new small billy can, but she only came on washing days. She washed on the same day that Mother and Sarah did, but never at the same hour. She always started later. She used to have to wait till they were finished with the tub. And always when she came with the billy, she would inquire when the tub would be available, and tell Mother to give it to Dave when he would be passing through for dinner. Mother always forgot to give the tub to Dave, and he would stroll home empty-handed and run back for it when Lily asked him where it was. The tub was a humbug to Dave, and he always had to put his head and whiskers inside it to carry it. He couldn't manage it any other way, because he always took two buckets of water with him as well. Those were the only occasions when Dave showed any ingenuity and a beautiful figure he cut to, hobbling along the track under the tub. People passing down the road used to shout derisively to him, but Dave would never look around. Joe witnessed Dave's departure one day, and armed himself with a lot of old potatoes to give him a send-off. And when Dave started to stagger away, Joe struck the tub with a potato, at which Barty guffawed. Dave stopped and swung steadily around like a large vessel turning in a river, and swore inside the tub. Dad came round the corner of the house and saw Dave and laughed. Dad was in a good humour that day. He had just received a cheque for £240 from the sale of some bullocks. Oh, oh, oh. Dad rumbled, and on the strength of Dad's merriment, Joe aimed another potato at Dave and struck the front of the tub. Then Dad changed his manner. 
We never knew anyone to change his manner so rapidly and completely as Dad used. Damn it! He roared at Joe. What the devil are you wasting good potatoes for? Confound it! Go away, man, and do something. And Dave said, By heavens, if any of them hits me, some of you will remember it. And he swung round again and ploughed up the track, irrigating both sides of it with spray from the buckets as he wobbled along. And during washing days, Sarah, though she wasn't speaking to Lily, kept a close eye on the latter's clothesline. And when Lily would be hanging out her things, Sarah from the back veranda would take stock of them, then go inside and say to Mother, Two shirts of dives, a quilt, a handkerchief, and two or three little things of her own is all she put through, I declare. And she's been all the evening doing that much. And when Mother wouldn't encourage further disparagement of Lily's labours, Sarah would return to the veranda and view the line again and soliloquise. When you had me do it for you, my lady, you could put out big enough washings so you could. Sarah had all the qualifications of a generous woman. Dave and Lily became accustomed to their new house and forgot all about its size and shapelessness. Dave began to take a pride in the establishment too and in his spare moments dug up some ground in front of the door to make a flower garden. But no flowers ever grew in Dave's garden. They never got any encouragement to grow. Dave never put any in. And people going in and out of the house paid no respect to the ground that was dug up. They always tramped across it as if it were a grass paddock till it got flattened down and became harder than it was before Dave cultivated it. Then Dave thought it wasn't good enough and decided to let it slide. It's no use thinking about it, he said. Should I get some palings to put round it and keep the people off? Dad put in an appearance one Sunday morning at Dave's place while Dave was away watering cows at the windmill. Well, Dad said to Lily, how do you like the new house now? It's all right, Father, Lily answered contentedly. Except that the door gets jammed a little somehow lately. It won't shut like it used to. Ah, Dad said, taking hold of the elegant door he had manufactured from some light slabs and hung with green hide hinges. And he shoved it shut with his two hands and violently dragged it open again. Then he got down on his knees and scratched some of the ground floor away and blew into the excavation with his mouth and examined the bottom hinge with both his eyes. Bless me, soul, he exclaimed. No wonder. Someone's taken the nails out of the hide. Lily bent down and peered over Dad's shoulder at the hinge. No one took them out, Father, she said meekly. They must have worked out themselves. Tut, tut, Dad snarled. These nails would never work out, woman. I'd drive them in myself. They must have, though, Father, Lily persisted humbly. Now how the devil could they? Dad yelled, jumping to his feet and facing his daughter with murder in his eye. Lily was startled and tottered back against the table and clutched the edge of it and stared at Dad. That was the first real taste Lily got of Dad. How could they? Dad repeated. If they could, then why the devil haven't all of them that I put in the slabs and the rafters and the shingles worked out? Dad, glaring at Lily, paused for an explanation. I, I don't know. She faltered. No, you don't, Dad shouted. And I'll tell you, because they couldn't for one thing, and because no one has ever touched them for another. Lily stared in silence and confusion at the floor and wished Dave would come. Worked out, Dad growled contemptuously, turning round to the action of the door again. Rubbish! Then, after a pause, Have you got a hammer here? Turning the whites of his eyes up at Lily. Y yes I think. Lily paused and looked nervously about the room. No, it isn't. She jerked out faintly. You have it at your own place. It's the first time it's been there, then. Dad growled. If I were down there and wanted it a hundred times, it'd be up here. And pulling open the door again, he went off to procure the hammer. But Dad never returned to fix the door. He found Gray waiting for him when he reached his own house and took him round to show him some young pigs. End of section three. Section four of Dave Brings Home a Wife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Dave Brings Home a Wife by Steele Rudd. Chapter 13. Lily's Mother Arrives. Lily came one morning and borrowed our pen and ink and wrote a letter to her mother. Dear Mother, it ran, I've been expecting to hear from some of yous every day, and I've not got a letter yet. It's just five months tomorrow, dear Mother, since we got married, and it only seems like a week. When are you coming to see us? Make up your mind when you come and stay a month. And Sissy could come and stay another month after you go back. I'm sure she will enjoy it herself. It would be a change for her, and we would be glad to have her with us. This is a real nice place. We have got our own house now, dear Mother, which is ever so much nicer than being in someone else's, where you never felt you could do what you liked. Though they were all very kind and all that, except Sarah, who is Dave's sister and is getting to be an old maid. But Dave said for me not to take any notice of her, and I never do now. Dear Mother, I have not much news to tell you, and I have Dave's dinner to get. He is chaff-cutting today and will soon be coming. Dear Mother, there are some very nice people here, and we often have them for company. A Mrs. Pills, whose husband knows father, lost her baby yesterday, and it is to be buried today. The day before it took sick there was nothing whatever the matter with it, but it took convulsions, and before Mr. Pills could get enough hot water to put it in, the poor little thing was dead. It was Mrs. Pills' first baby, too, and everyone about is so sorry over it. P.S. Dave is here now, and he has brought some eggs and a young kitten, with love to all at home. I remain, dear mother, your affectionate daughter, Lily Rudd. And in due course, Lily's mother sent an answer, saying she, Hoped it would find Lily and Dave quite well and in good health and spirits, as it left her at present, thank God. And accepted the invitation to stay a month, and named the day on which she would arrive at the railway station, and hoped Dave would meet her. When the day came round, Lily was all impatience and excitement. She rose a couple of hours earlier than usual, and began making preparations, decorated the place, nailed bags and newspaper pictures and things all over the inside of it. She came to Mother during the morning, too, for some baking soda, and went back and made a dishful of burnt scones. Altogether, she came to Mother about sixteen times during the morning for one thing and another, and every time told her how pleased she was that Mother was coming, and discoursed about her parents' age and the colour of her hair before it turned grey, and the length of it and the good teeth she had, and promised to bring her down some evening to see Mother. Lily didn't tell Sarah anything about her parent, though. Sarah was never present when Lily was about. But Sarah was interested in the old lady's visit for all that. Sarah used to listen to everything Lily said, and when the latter had left, would drop in with a broom in her hand and sweep vigorously round Mother where there was no dirt or dust. After putting in a few useless strokes with the broom, Sarah would toss her loose hair back and, leaning on the handle, remark, A wonderful thing, isn't it? A mother coming. You'd think no one else ever had a mother. But Mother wouldn't encourage Sarah to ridicule her sister. Mother had been young herself once, and understood the peculiarities of women. And women's peculiarities are many and varied, especially young women. At midday, Dave left off the chaff-cutting, and yoked a horse in the spring cart to go to the railway station for his mother-in-law. Dad, on a round of inspection, entered the yard. "'Why, what's up now?' he asked, staring in astonishment at Dave, perched in the cart when he should have been employed cutting chaff. Going the rear way from Mother, Dave said. Peru! Dad yelled. Mother, Dave repeated. She's coming today, didn't you know? Dad swung his two hands about as if he were engaged in a hammer-throwing competition, and hobbling round the cart, looked up hard at Dave from the other side. I a mad fella! He roared. Why, bless me soul! Ain't your mother in the house? And Dad tried to force a grin. Oh, I don't mean her. Dave sniggered. Me other mother. Lil's her woman. For a second or two, Dad just stared at Dave with all his eyes and mouth. Then... Well, if you've got so many damned mothers that you've got to waste the whole day running about at their tails with a horse and cart, the sooner you go and work with some of them all together, the better. Dave was hurt in his dignity. "'By cripes, then,' he growled. "'If you're not careful, I will.' And he drove off. 
Dave had to drive to the yard gate, then wheel round and come down along the fence to reach the road. Dad cut across to intercept him, and hanging over the wires, yelled, And who's going to look after me, Chaff, while you're running about the damned country? You can, Dave shouted. You're so bigger and smart. And he rattled onto the road, leaving nothing but dust and wheel tracks behind for Dad to swear at. While Dave was away at the railway station, Lily swept up the ground in front of the new house and gathered the loose chips and bones and empty tins that were lying about and stacked them in a heap. Then she sat back near the door and hummed tunes and watched the road for signs of the cart's return. Towards sundown, Dave, with a sinewy, talkative little woman beside him in the cart, came trotting up to the big white gate. Is this the place? The little woman, who was Dave's mother-in-law, asked, fixing her small brown eyes in an admiring kind of way on our place, with all the fruit trees and barn and outbuildings and yards and haystacks about it. No, nah. Dave said cheerfully. That's the old chaps. Ours is a new place further up. And he swung the whip round his head, indicating pretty well every part of the compass. Dave's place, sitting among the grass, was plain enough for Mrs White to see as they drove up but the fact didn't occur to her that it was a dwelling, and she looked over the top of it, straining her eyes at Gray's big house, the roof of which was just visible in the dim distance. But when Dave suddenly cried, Wah! and pulled up in front of his door, and Lily rushed to the wheel to greet her, Mrs. White noticed it was a residence, and her countenance took a turn. It changed suddenly. The look of joyous, lively expectation it had worn all the way from the railway station left it, and she seemed inclined to remain in the cart, as if the drive hadn't lasted half long enough for her. Dave, with the air of an advance agent for a circus, hopped out as nimble and light-footed as a goat. You'd think it was the Queen, or Melba, or a gold escort he was in charge of, not his mother-in-law at all. Give us a hold of your mother he said, extending his big hairy hand to the amazed-looking passenger. And I'll help you out. And she looked as if she wanted helping out some too. And without uttering a word, without even taking her eyes off the house, Mrs White scrambled to the ground. Then Lily pounced on her and hugged her hard and repeatedly, and told her how pleased she was to see her again. And Dave said, Look out for yourselves there and started the horse again, and drove to the stable to take the brute out of the cart, and left his mother-in-law's handbag in it. "'You don't mean to tell me, girl,' Mrs. White said, when Lily took her inside, "'that this is the place you're living in.' And she stared all around with misery and tears in her eyes. "'Well, it is,' Lily answered apologetically. "'But you know, mother, we couldn't get on very well together in the other house.' And this was put up in a great hurry when they were all so busy. But it's only for a while. Mr. Rudd means to have a real good house built for us soon. Mrs. White wrinkled her brow and stared disparagingly at the inoffensive-looking furniture. It's no place for a man to bring his wife to, she said warmly. And I'm sure you're not happy in it, girl. I'd sooner see you camping under a dray, so I would. But it's not for long, mother. Lily said, with an effort to appear cheerful. We might be out of it any time now. But Lily's mother, though weedy-looking and grey, was a stubborn little person, and had some deep-rooted convictions as to what a comfortable dwelling should be like. Even if it had been put up well enough, she snapped, gazing at the coalition roof, a mixture of decayed shingle and kerosene tin flattened out with a hammer. It's not big enough for a pigeon box. Then, after lowering her eyes and making further discoveries, Oh, dear, oh, dear. Why, there isn't a board on the floor. Well, I wanted them to put... Lily, it's a shame. Mrs. White squealed, interrupting her daughter. And if they can't afford a better house for you to live in than this, then you must come back home. I never saw such a place. It's worse than a lock-up. I'd sooner be in a lock-up. It's a pigsty to take you away from your good home, too, and dump you here in such a kennel. Oh, dear, dear, what a sin! Lifting her voice to a shriek. It's a crime, and if you catch your death of cold in it, my girl, it will be murder. And I'll tell him as soon as he comes in. 
and Mrs. White would have walked up and down too, she was so angry, but there wasn't any room for exercising in Dave's house. Dave's house wasn't built for a gymnasium. Now, mother, Lily pleaded, the tears running down her cheeks. Don't, don't do that. Don't say anything to Dave about it. It's not his fault. He has done all he can do. It's all Mr. Rudd's. Then I'll tell him what I think of the house he has put you into, and what I think of him, too. Mrs. White screeched, shaking her head angrily. How would he like to see his own daughter? Here, Lily heard Dave coming along whistling up the track, and silencing her mother, hurried to lay the table for supper. Well, mother? Dave said, bowling in with a broad grin on his bearded face. What do you think of our castle? The blood rushed to Mrs. White's cheeks, but she kept down her emotions pretty well, and with a fair amount of composure said, Well, I hope you don't intend to live in it all your life. That's all. I'll buy Jove now. Dave answered with glad assurance. A new five-room place soon, out of the next barley. The old man was talking about it only this morning. Hmm. Well, I know what old men are, and I'd keep him to it. Mrs. White said with another shake of her head, and she said it in a disagreeably pleasant way too. Mrs. White had a lot of intuition about her. She had never seen Dad in her life, yet she seemed to know the kind of man he was just by studying Dave's house. Well, come on, Dave said, changing the subject. And we'll have something to eat. And we gathered round and sat at supper, and the meal passed off almost in silence. Dave, never a brilliant conversationalist, was too hungry to talk, and Lily was kept too busy pouring out tea for him to say much. While the odd scraps of furniture and the poverty-stricken appearance of the walls and the patched roof with the moon and stars peeping through at her absorbed most of Mrs. White's troubled thoughts. Now and then she would glance uneasily from the little broken-down couch on which she sat to the entrance to the bedroom, which was screened by a dangling sack, as though the solution of some serious problem was agitating her mind. Whether she was to seek repose for the night on the couch, or under Dave's bed, or on top of the house. But she didn't reveal her thoughts. Dave finished eating and broke in on the silence. He said, You ought another £250 cheque for Bullocks this morning, Lou and leaned back as if he were Jimmy Tyson, the millionaire. Goodness! Lily answered, opening her eyes in astonishment. Another 250 pounds. That's 500 pounds the last fortnight. Yes. Dave drawled, stooping down and handing the cat a plug of meat on the end of a fork. Then turning slowly to Mrs. White. That's a good price, I got mother. 500 pounds for 63-year-old bollocks, and I'll have more ready in a month. Dave's mother-in-law's countenance underwent another change. Her eyes lit up and she stared at her son-in-law as though she had suddenly discovered he was an unpretentious millionaire. And whose is all that money? She asked, to make certain her surmise was correct. Oh, ours, Dave said. My colonial. And helped the cat to more meat. Then Mrs. White stared harder than ever at Dave and looked around again at the miserable wretched furniture and smiled an incredulous smile, until Lily thought it proper to make an explanation. At least we don't get all that money, Dave, Lily said, looking at her husband. Oh, no, Dave drawled, addressing his mother-in-law. The old man gets it, but we all make it, you know. It belongs to the lot of us, when we want anything. He went on for her general information. We get it. Don't matter what it is. A horse or a cart, trip to town, beef or rations, a few bob, anything. It's always there. Lil gets what she wants too, just the same. Turning to Lil with a grin. I'm going down in the morning to ask the old man for a quid. Wonder what he'll say. And your father has everything then? Mrs. White said, this time with a pained, puzzled expression. Oh, yes. Dave answered. Everything. Sip Lil. And then he grinned. But Mrs. White didn't join in Dave's joke. She scowled and sat considering hard. And after a while she looked compassionately at Lily and said, Well, I don't know where you're going to put me, child, but I feel quite done up and must go to bed somewhere or other. 
Lily explained that Dave would sleep on the floor in the front room, and that her mother could take his place in her bed. Then apologising to Dave for leaving him in the dark, she took the lamp and showed her mother the way in. Dave, with his boots off and his feet resting on the table, sat planning the programme for the morrow's work. After a while, Lily called out, Did you take a bag of mothers out of the cart, Dave? Dave reflected. No, he said. I never. Well, it must be in it yet, Lily answered anxiously, coming out of the room. And she wants it. Her nightgown is in it. Ha, huh. Dave grunted. Wish I had known before pulling off me boots. Those cows have had the cart out since, too, getting green stuff for the pigs. Then dragging his bluchers on again, he trudged off to the shed. Dave struck a match and searched the cart, but no bag was there. Flaring lights and a lot of noise and rioting going on in the barn attracted him. He went to the door and looked in. Joe was there, careering round in the nightdress and swinging the handbag about, while Bill and Tom and Barty laughed and husked cobs and threw them at him. Here, Dave said indignantly, stepping in and approaching Joe. I'm looking for that. Why couldn't you leave it where it was? Oh. <laughs> Joe chuckled, dragging the garment over his hat. It's yours, is it? Is that what you wear when you get married? The Huskers laughed. Do all married coves have to wear them? More mirth. Never mind. Dave answered seriously, snatching the long white robe from Joe and marching off with it over his arm like a coat and carrying the bag in his hand. And as he went out, a cob of corn struck the side of the door in close proximity to his head, scattering grains all around like a charge of shot, one of which stung Dave in the ear. Dave jumped round. Now, who the deuce was that? He said, running his eye over the others. Bill and Tom dropped their heads between their knees and giggled and husked vigorously. Joe, standing in the middle of the floor, gave a short laugh, and Barty, with a guilty look on his face, rose to his feet and began looking for openings in the wall. You crawler, Dave said, rushing at Barty and flogging him round the barn with the ornamental end of the nightdress. Unable to escape, Barty turned in a corner and stood at bay. Fling another of your cobs at me, Willie, Dave hissed, slashing again at him. Barty showed his teeth and seized hold of the garment and clung to it. Dave gave a fierce wrench to release it, and all the frills came away with a rip and a tear and remained with Barty. By oh, heavens, you tore it! Dave said, alarmed looking, and he paused to examine the damage. Then Barty left the corner with a bound and bolted for the door. Loud, boisterous laughter rang after him, and the north and south ends of him were hit hard with cobs and small pumpkins as he dived through into the darkness. Did you get it? Lily asked, as Dave strode in with the habiliment in his hand. Yes, I got it all right, Dave said, tossing the garment to her. Lily stared. Goodness me, you needn't have opened it, she said. Oh, I didn't open it, Dave answered, starting to pull off his boots again. And Lily turned and went in to her mother. What on earth has happened to it? Mrs. White exclaimed. It was rolled in brown paper in my bag. I do declare the dogs or something have been added. Two-layered dogs, Dave drawled, planting his big stockinged feet on the table again and leaning back contentedly. And as he reflected on the episode, the humour of it all seemed to strike him, and lifting his voice he added, It were Ja, the jet. He had it on when I went down and a low rumbling noise intended for a laugh came from him. Had it on! Mrs. White shrieked from the bedroom. My nightgown? Who? Why, what? Oh, the savages. Take it away, Lily. I wouldn't have it near me. Take it away, child, and give me my petticoat. Oh, my gracious me, what kind of barbarians are you amongst at all? Are you in, Dave? A harsh voice called from outside. Dave, recognising it, shouted, Come on in, Jimmy. What are you after? And Jimmy Regan, the wild harem scarum of the district, groped his way in at the door. Find a seat somewhere there, Jimmy, Dave said hospitably. Lyle will be here directly. Won't stay long, Jimmy rejoined, speaking in a loud voice and leaning against the wall. 
Gotta go round to old Gray yet to see if he'll stump out the couple of days he owes me brother for thrashing. But what I've come for is the loan of a nag. Can you lend us one to go to town on tomorrow, Dave? Dave required some time to consider, and Jimmy rattled on. Saw you flying along the railway this evening, Dave, but you were too high up to look my way. Who was the old girl with all the ribbons and things on that you was bucket up to in the cart? Dave shuffled his feet uneasily. The thinnest armful I ever see. Dave tried to shove the table down to make a noise, but it was built into the ground. By heaven, she were a freak, and the way she... But Jimmy was suddenly interrupted. What is that brute saying, Lily? Came in shrill tones from the interior of the bedroom. Dave didn't wait to hear any more. He sprang to his feet and kicked over a gin case, which hardly made any noise either, and groped in the dark for Jimmy, and said quietly, Come out here. Jimmy followed Dave, and they walked a short distance from the house. What the devil's the matter? Jimmy asked, standing and staring into Dave's face. She heard you, Dave answered in low, cautious tones. There she, she heard everything you said. But that weren't the wife's voice, Jimmy replied, more mystified than ever. Nah, from Dave. It's me mother-in-law there. Didn't you know it was her I was bringing in the cart? Jimmy jumped in the air. Jimmy was enlightened. Oi! he exclaimed, stepping back a pace and looking more concerned than ever. Ain't I put me foot in it? Why didn't you give us a hint? Then Dave, in his own agreeable fashion, excused Jimmy, told him it didn't matter, and added that he could have the loan of a horse in the morning if he came up for it before the old man was up. Evans! Jimmy chuckled at the sound of Mrs. White's voice again. She is rearing yet. And turning to go away, he said, I wouldn't go in there again, Dave, without a gun, for the best horse you've got in the paddock and a billet all the year round. Dave grinned in the dark and without any gun went inside and faced the music for nothing. End of section four. Section 5 of Dave Brings Home a Wife This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dave Brings Home a Wife by Steele Rudd Chapter 14 Lily's Mother Meets Dad Tired and all as Mrs. White was, and notwithstanding she shared the best bed in the house, she hardly slept a wink that night, and blamed Dave for her bad night's rest. "'I never heard such a man to snore,' she said complainingly to Lily in the morning. "'Oh, the whole blessed night he simply roared and groaned. It was hideous. I don't know how on earth you stand it, girl.' "'Ah, uh, yes, but he's always so tired, mother, after his hard day's work,' Lily answered, putting on her clothes. And see how early he goes to the yard. He has always to dress himself by lamplight, but I never notice him snoring much now. He's not nearly so bad as he used to be. And she went out to prepare the breakfast. Oh, dear. Mrs. White sighed and turned over in the bed. A glorious early autumn morning, the air clear and crisp. All was life and stir at Rudville. Families of cockatoos clambered and chattered up in the gully. Small birds chirped and tweaked from the trees and the fence tops. A stock whip cracked at intervals in the big grass paddock. The horses came galloping and careering in. A mob of cows of every colour gathered at the yard, and a hundred calves were bellowing in the pens. Mrs. White rose and went out into the fresh air, and stood studying the scene. At intervals she would turn from the picture that our place, with the green trees and rows of great haystacks about it, presented, to Dave's grotesque little house, the grim, ludicrous aspect of which was accentuated by the light of day and shake her grey head, and murmur plaintively, Dear, dear, dear. A number of cows that had been milked and released in the yard wandered up and surrounded Dave's place, sniffing and licking the ground where Lily had thrown the salt dishwater. All sleek, well-bred cows, too, with roomy, fleshless udders, 
and Mrs. White was admiring them when Dave staggered up the track, carrying a jug of milk for the breakfast in one hand, a bucket of water in the other, a leg rope that he was to mend over one arm, a half coil of wire to make a clothesline out of round his neck, a billy of ripe tomatoes which Mother brought to the yard for him to give to Lily in his teeth, and a large crowned pumpkin on his head. Morning, Mother, Dave said through his nose. Them's good milkers. And he staggered inside, breathing noisily, and unloaded himself. Dave poured some of the water into a dish and sluiced himself with it. Then he joined Mrs. White, and rubbing his face and beard hard with the towel to dry himself, said, looking at the cattle, You don't often see cows like them, mother. That's a little milker. Pointing to a red beast. If you had a thousand like her, you'd be worth something. Twenty-five quarts a day she's been given for the last eleven months. And I got her for ten pounds. Wow, beauty, poor little beauty. Approaching the brute and rubbing and scratching her back affectionately. That's a sort of cow, mother. Can milk her anywhere. Know anything about a cow, mother? Dave stepped back from the cow and grinned a learned sort of grin. Tain't everyone does. The old man's been among cow all his life and he can't tell one yet. Running his eye through the cattle. You'd think that one there'd give a good lot of milk, wouldn't you? Pointing out a strawberry with a low, dragging udder. Mrs. White thought the cow would. Well, she don't give enough to keep a kid. Dave chuckled. See that little cow there? Mrs. White did. Well, you wouldn't think that that big brindle bullock just coming up here was a son of theirs. And Dave grinned an admiring kind of grin. Breakfast! Lily called from the house and Dave, giving his hairy arms a final scrub with the towel, started to lead the way in. "'That's the Queen,' he said, shooing an old warrior out of the way as he approached the door. "'She's a cow that poked mother. I was nearly shooting her too for it, the old devil.' They sat down to breakfast, and Dave piled sufficient salt junk and fried potatoes onto his mother-in-law's plate to satisfy several men. Dave was not a mean man with meat. "'That's a good bit of meat, mother.' Dave said, munching ravenously himself. A great little bullock that came off her. Mrs. White merely nodded. Kill all our own beef, mother. Dave went on, with pride in his eye. Them spuds is all our own grown, too. Suppose you don't see many spuds like them down your way, eh, mother? Mrs. White remarked that the potatoes they got at Prosperity were very good indeed. Ah, but though. Dave enthused. You want to see the ones we have in the bottom, Biddy. They're whoppers. Turning to his wife with hunger still lurking in his eye. Any old melon jam left, Lil? Lily produced a pickle bottle half full. This is all her own making, Mother. Dave continued, upending the bottle and raking the contents onto his plate with a table knife. Mrs. White stared at Dave's plate, then at the empty bottle, but didn't say anything. She didn't help herself to any jam, either. Well... Dave yawned contentedly, rising from the table, and stretching out his arms, which reached from one wall to the other. Then go go down now and tackle the old chap for that pound, Lil. There's no hurry for it, his wife answered carelessly. I won't be wanting it for a day or two yet. Might as well get it and be done with it, though, what I think of it, Dave replied, and putting on his hat, went off whistling. That old man must be making piles of money. Mrs. White said reflectively, standing at the door when Dave had departed, and gazing again over Rudville. You've no idea how much he's getting, Mother, Lily said, her cheeks starting to glow with the pride of relationship to Dad. Ninety pounds a month, Dave says he gets for milk. I forget what the check was he got this year for wheat, whether it was four hundred or five. There was five hundred pounds I know for bullocks, and sixty or eighty for pigs. Then look at all the chaff and other things he sells, and he has ever so much land. I don't know how many thousand acres. And yet... Mrs. White sighed with a gloomy shake of her head. With all that money, this is the kind of place he puts up for his son to live in. What a mean, miserable old vagabond he must be. And she turned her head and cast another sickly glance at the interior of Dave's castle. Lily turned crimson. Her enthusiasm suddenly left her and she plunged into the breakfast things to clear them away. In half an hour, Dave returned, but he wasn't whistling. He was pale as a ghost and in a violent temper. Cripes, he said, dropping on the couch and striking the table hard with his old felt hat. 
He's an old dog, by Christopher. What on earth has happened? Lily asked, alarmed looking. Happened? By cripes. A good job for him he's not someone else's father, or something would have happened. By the wall. Surely to goodness you haven't been quarrelling over that blessed pound, Lily put in apprehensively. If he offered me ten pounds, I wouldn't take it now, Dave yelled, striking the table again with his hat. By heavens, he's a thankless old wretch. By cripes. I wouldn't take any notice of him, Dave. I just... Ah, he's an old devil. But I wouldn't have asked him for anything this morning, Dave, if he was in a temp... By cripes, he'll wait a long time before I ask him for anything again. By holy. Then Dave put on his hat and walked round the house several times, muttering, By cripes, by holy. And when the torrent of his wrath subsided, took the coil of wire and went off to erect the clothesline. An hour later, Dad appeared. He approached the spot where Dave was struggling with the clothesline and roared, How much more time are you going to waste up here? That's old Mr. Rudd. Lily, terrified looking, whispered to her mother on hearing Dad's voice. Where's my hat? Mrs. White cried, glancing hurriedly about the room with fire flashing from her eyes. I wouldn't go out, Mother. I wouldn't. He's in a fearful temper. Lily pleaded. Now don't. But Mrs. White snatched up the hat nearest to her, an old one of Lily's, and out she stepped. Is the hay to be left there run while you're idling and humbugging? Dad stopped short and glared round on hearing the voice of a female beside him. You're Mr. Rudd, Mrs. White said, with a tremor in her voice, squaring herself in front of Dad and looking up into his angry face. Dad glowered down at Mrs. White in the way that a bulldog, in the act of worrying something, might turn to contemplate the unexpected presence of a cat. I'm Lily's mother. Throwing a swift glance back at the house, in the open door of which stood Lily with her hands clasped before her. Well, Dad growled. What if you are? Then I want to ask you if you think that a humpy like that... Mrs. White pointed her lean finger contemptuously at Dave's house. It's a fit place for a woman to live in. Dad was astounded. He opened his mouth and eyes and for a moment or two glared in astonishment. Then... Why, what in the devil have you got to do with it? He bellowed, bending down and poking his beard right into Mrs. White's face. A great deal, a great deal. I have everything to do with it, Mrs. White screeched, stamping her little foot and clenching her bony fists. And just don't you think you can frighten me, and don't you use your low language on me either. I am that girl's mother, and if you think any old pigsty of a place that doesn't cost you anything to put up is good enough to throw her into, then I tell you it's like your impudence. Is it your place? Dad shouted. Did I put it up for you? Oh, it isn't my place, and I wouldn't have. Then what in the devil brings you here talking to me about it? Be off with your woman and mind your own business. And Dad threw up his arms to wave her away. It is my business, and I won't be off. Not a single inch. Mrs. White shrieked, stamping her foot again. When I see the wretched shed that you ask my daughter to live in, it's my business to tell you that you ought to be well ashamed of yourself. So you ought. Look at it. Pointing her finger again at Dave's house. Look at it. Look at the hole you ask her to live in. Not a chimney, not even a veranda. Nothing but a pile of dirty old slabs and shingles that would never keep out a drop of rain. They're not even nailed on properly. Get away with your insolence, woman. Dad broke out violently. Come, found you. It isn't fit to house calves in. There are hundreds of calf pens, palaces in comparison with it. Damn it. Dad yelled. Clear off with you, or I'll go and pull the whole thing down. And well you might, Mrs. White hissed. And well you might. It wouldn't be hard. It wouldn't want much pulling to fetch it down. The wonder is it hasn't fallen down on their heads long ago. Oh, the pile of rubbish that it is. Look here! Dad howled with indignation and murder in his eye. Do you know whose property this is, you standard-on woman? 
i know whose property it wouldn't be if every one had their own if your son had his due for all that he has done for you it would be his you're a loyal woman it would mrs white shouted it would and you know it but he hasn't he hasn't anything you give him nothing you take everything out of him and grind and grind him down and drive him and use him and starve him as if he was nothing more than a working bullock to you and when he dares to ask you for a paltry pound you blackguard him and you abuse him you do so you do what dad yelled jumping into the air what you're not a man mrs white rattled on there's nothing of the man about you and you're not a christian you're a mean selfish old screw so you are you are you are stamping her foot after every r to the devil out of this to the devil with your screaming you you runt of a woman you you tom cat dad howled placing his big hands on mrs white's shoulders and shoving her from him out of here or i'll throw you into the road keep your hands off mrs white shrieked keep your hands off of me dare you strike a woman and she turned and lifted a huge gum stick that was lying at her feet and struck at dad and hissed Kerr! and coward at every stroke dad foamed and moved backwards for a while receiving the blows manfully on his uplifted arm damn you he said at last and turned from his assailant with his back humped then mrs white brought the stick down hard on his shoulders squealing an accompaniment brute would you curse a respectable woman then dad started to run and mrs white ran too she pursued him for twenty yards or more then gave up and heaved the stick after him squealing coward 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 dad didn't stop or make any attempt to retire gracefully or under cover of fire dad made straight for his own house dad had met his waterloo and dave who through all the combat had stood open-mouthed and with awe on his face expecting every moment to witness a tragic end to his mother-in-law regarded the result of the encounter with the liveliest satisfaction he dropped in the grass and wriggled and chuckled and scratched and kicked up earth at dad's ludicrous retreat mrs white pale and perspiring her fragile frame trembling with excitement and anger returned to lily <sighs> get me some water child she gasped oh my gracious and she flopped down in a heap on the couch holding her two hands over her heart it'll kill me child i'll drop i'll drop oh that brute of a man to upset me so lily rushed in with a cup of water and her mother eagerly swallowed it all up then lay back on the couch moaning it'll kill me oh it'll kill me dad reached the garden in safety and slammed the hand gate behind him with violence he swore at the top of his voice too at the dog and kicked at the brute when it bounded up to him and whimpered affectionately as if congratulating him on his escape dad hurried up the steps and tripped against a rocking chair and turned and used violent language to it and booted it along the veranda and when it didn't go to pieces lifted it in his hand and heaved it into the top of a peach tree whatever is the matter mother said coming on the scene don't come near me don't come near me woman dad yelled i'm in a terrible temper and away he hobbled to his room mother followed puzzled looking but dad closed the door and locked himself in and for an hour or more nothing but blasphemy mingled with heavy groans came from dad's room dad was a bad loser end of section five Section 6 of Dave Brings Home a Wife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dave Brings Home a Wife by Steele Rudd. Chapter 15 Dad Holds a Post Mortem. While Dad was sulking in his room, a valuable Jersey cow that had cost us fifteen pounds tried to jump into the lucerne near the house and got caught in the wires and hung by the legs, straining and kicking and tearing strips of flesh from every limb in her frantic efforts to get free. Mother ran to Dad's door and called out excitedly, Let her die there! 
Dad bellowed back. It's a pity they're not all stuck in it. Oh dear, dear, Mother murmured, joining Sarah, who with the axe in her hand approached the troubled beast. She'll kill herself, she will. And that one of the boys about. Sarah hacked at the fence until she severed the wire. Then the cow struggled on to her feet and ran on the lucerne and began eating ravenously. Then Dad appeared on the veranda. What the devil do you want destroying the fence for? He yelled. What else could we do? Sarah answered angrily. You could have undone it! Dad yelled louder. Undone it? Sarah sneered. Why didn't you come then and undo it yourself? You hussy, if you give me any impertinence! Here, Dad, with a determined stride, moved towards the steps as though he meant to descend and swallow Sarah, axe and all. But when halfway down, he stopped, and waving his hand, roared, Are you gonna leave her there to bust herself on the confounded lucerne? Sarah ran round the cow and drove her out, and proceeded to barricade the gap in the fence with some sticks that were lying about. Then Dad, growling to himself, returned to his room and locked himself in again. Half an hour later, Willie Wiley, MacDonald's orphan boy, rushed onto the veranda in a state of excitement. Where's Mr. Rudge? he said to Mother. They want him at Walker's. Sam Walker has hung herself with a leg rope. Hung himself? Mother and Sarah exclaimed in the same breath. Yes, hung herself. Willie gasped. Just now, this morning. Oh, his poor wife. Mother moaned. And they're not even three months married. Sarah sighed. They want Mr. Rudd to come quick. Willie added. Cause he's hanging yet. Oh, gracious me. And Mother hurried to Dad's room again. What has it to do with me? What do I want with him? Dad howled. Let him hang. The devil take him. Pity there wasn't some more hanging with him. Mother pleaded through the keyhole with Dad and reminded him that he was a justice of the peace. To the devil with the justice of the peace! Dad shouted. I don't know what on earth's come over the man, Mother groaned, returning to the veranda. Then she sent Sarah down the paddock to summon one of the boys. Who was it wanted me? Dad growled, coming from his room at last. They want you over at Walker's, Mother explained quietly. The poor man has hanged himself with a rope. The best thing that could happen to him, Dad grunted, descending the steps slowly. The best thing. At the garden gate, he loitered a while, then glancing along the lucerne paddock fence, called out, Is that panel fixed up? Mother said that Sarah had seen to it. Seen to it? Dad shouted. Those bits of sticks wouldn't keep a hen out. Tell some of those fellas when they come in to mend it properly. Very well, very well, Mother answered, and Dad directed his steps towards Walker's. He had hardly covered ten yards of the way when his restless eyes settled on the new spring cart standing in the glaring hot sun. Damn it all! He muttered, snapping his fingers. Confound it! Look at that! And he hurried back to the garden fence. Ooh, the juice left the cart out there! He roared. Mother hadn't the slightest idea. I'll tell them to put it in, or I'll put a stop to them touching it at all! Mother said she would. Dad, grunting, turned away again and tripped over a long-handled shovel lying in the grass. A juice take those devils up their eyes. Who left this here? He howled. Mother looked puzzled. Then Dad lifted the implement and heaved it savagely into the garden and broke the handle against a peach tree. If they had to do their work without implements at all, he grumbled, they'd know how to look after things better than they do. And again he headed for Walker's. As he passed out the big white gate, little Mary Murphy, barefooted and picking her way tenderly through the prickly tufts of dead Bathurst burr strewn over the hard road, shyly accosted him. Please, Mr. Rudd, Mary said, glancing up timidly from beneath a large calico bonnet. Me mother says, would you oblige father with a lend of the spring cart to go to town in tomorrow? No, I won't. I'll lend no spring cart. Damn the spring cart, Dad blurted out. I didn't buy it to lend round the country. Then he went on again, leaving Mary standing on the road with her head down and her finger in her mouth. When about fifty yards from the gate, a thin voice screeched after Dad. Keep your dirty old cart. 
Dad jumped round and saw Mary, regardless of bare feet and Bathurst burr, running for dear life. When Dad arrived at Walker's farm, quite a crowd of sad, helpless-looking spectators had gathered in sympathy there. "'What's up?' Dad asked abruptly, pushing his way through them like a policeman. "'Sam's thrown a sponge up,' young Regan answered, pointing to the body dangling in the doorway of the shed that served as a dairy. "'Slipped his win.' The others grinned mournfully at Regan. Dad contemplated the grim spectacle in silence for a moment or two, just as he might have regarded a sheep on the gamble. Then, "'Made a nice picture of himself,' he growled, and taking off his hat, poked his head in between the hanging body and the doorpost to survey the interior of the dairy. Dad was more interested in milk dishes than he was in suicides. "'Will I cut him down?' young Regan asked, advancing to the hanging form with an open pocket knife in his hand. Ought to be nearly time now. Not at all, Dad yelled authoritatively. Leave him where he be until the police come, unless you want to be suspected of having a hand in it. Supposing the chap ain't dead, but... Regan persisted. Well, supposing he ain't, Dad answered. Won't make any difference. He'll have to hang there just the same. It's the law. The law I don't see much sense in, then, the other sneered, closing his knife with a look of disappointment. No, of course you don't, Dad replied. You wouldn't see any sense in being hanged yourself if you killed a man, would you? Then Dad grinned triumphantly on the crowd, all of whom grinned in turn at Regan's discomfiture. Regan said, Rot, and slunk away. Then Dad, seeing Mrs. Walker grieving beside the water cask, approached her. Dad didn't put his arms around Mrs. Walker. He didn't condole with her either, or offer her any words of encouragement at all. Dad was present in his official capacity. What put it into his head to play the fool like that? He asked, pointing to the corpse. Mrs. Walker couldn't offer any reason for the deed at all. Sure you wasn't nagging at him? Dad said sternly. Like all of you do? (laughs) No, no, the woman sobbed. My husband was fond of me. He always said he loved me so much. (laughs) Yes, Dad mumbled, turning away from her. Looks like it, doesn't it? Then giving final injunctions to all present not to interfere with the body or anything about the place till the police arrived, Dad said he'd send a wire and retraced his steps home. End of section six. Section seven of Dave Brings Home a Wife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dave Brings Home a Wife by Steel Rudd Chapter 16. Dad Relents For two days after his encounter with Mrs. White, Dad was unapproachable. He moped on the veranda, sulking and brooding like a bear with a bad head. If you went near him or ventured to ask him anything, he'd break into violent language and roar at you to clear... The devil! But one evening, he went for a short walk, and after returning, cooled down and took Mother into his confidence. They talked about Dave's house. Well, it's not a good enough one for them, Father, Mother said persuasively. Not nearly. Not when we have so much money, and you can so well afford to pay for a better one. Very well, then. Very well, Dad said. I can have whatever they like. Makes no difference to me. The carpenters at Gray's will be finished up there in a day or so, and I'll see what they'll put one up for. A four-roomed house, Mother suggested, with a veranda all around would be good enough. Whatever they like, Dad answered. Whatever they like. I can have a ten-roomed one for all I care. Mother smiled at Dad and said, And what you should also do, Father, is allow Dave, now that he is married, something a week and let him keep his wife and his own house out of it. It would be more satisfactory for them. Dad conceded cheerfully to Mother's suggestion. If he'd rather have it that way, certainly. Why not? He could have had it long ago if he'd asked so. Would have been all the same to me. Then, after reflecting, What do we give him? Dad's generosity was running away with him. Thirty shillings a week, or two pounds, would be enough. Mother suggested. Give him two pounds, or two pounds too, Dad answered. Mother smiled again. Yes, make it two pounds too. 
and Dad rose, and was walking up and down the veranda, when suddenly he gave a loud roar. "'Confound it!' he exclaimed, coming to a standstill. "'Confound it!' "'Whatever is the matter?' Mother said, staring after Dad. "'Bless my soul!' And Dad started walking fast. "'What on earth is wrong, man?' Mother followed Dad along the veranda with an alarmed look on her face. The devil take it! Stopping and swinging his clenched fist about. The devil take it! That wire! And Dad snapped his fingers and looked at Mother. But to Mother, Dad was unintelligible. Are you going crazy, man? She asked. I forgot to send it, woman. To send it to the police. Mother understood. Oh, dear! Dear, she moaned, the poor woman, oh my, and all this time. And Mother looked reproachfully at Dad. Tom, Tom! Dad bellowed through the house, then turning to Mother. On the fools, I suppose I've left him hanging there all this time. Bill, Bill! To Mother again. They wouldn't have sense enough to cut him down, I suppose. Tom! Buddy! Bill! But there was no response to Dad's yells. Where the devil have they got to at all? He raved. Bill! Tom! Joe, with a tired walk, strolled in from the paddock where he had been ploughing all day. Why the juice ain't some of your belt when you wanted? Dad yelled to him. Joe stared wonderingly at Dad, then broke into a smile. Don't stand there grinning like a wild cat, Dad roared. Get a horse, fellow, and go to the railway and send a telegram for the police at once. Police? Joe answered, puzzled looking. What the deuce do you want with the police? Confound it, get the horse! And Dad threw out his two arms and stamped his foot at Joe. Joe continued to smile. Sha! you idiot! Will you stand there all day? That poor man, Mother put in for Joe's information, is still hanging. And there was a pale, piteous look in Mother's face. Joe gave a short snigger. <laughs> Baha, he said. We buried him days ago. And he turned away. What? Dad yelled, breaking into a fresh fit of frenzy and hobbling after Joe. What? Buried him? Who dared to? Who told you to? Hang it, I did myself. Joe snapped, turning and facing Dad again. You did? You meddled with the law? You idiot! You, you, do you know? Look here, Joe said, interrupting Dad. I think you'd better send a wire for a warder. That's what you want. Then he left Dad and went off to feed the horses. End of section 7「Section 8 of Dave Brings Home a Wife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dave Brings Home a Wife by Steele Rudd. Chapter 17. Dad Forgets the Past. I think you're a good deal to blame yourselves, Mrs. White said, when Lily and Dave told her of Dad's generosity. I do indeed. And I really believe you'd have had a good house from the very beginning if you had only had the courage to stick out for it. It takes you to talk to him, Mother, Dave drawled, in cheerful admiration of his mother-in-law. And so could you talk to him. So could anyone if they had a bit of go in them, Mrs. White snapped. After all, I believe your father's the best man of the lot of you. He's only what you've all made him. Dave grinned, a hard, senseless sort of grin, and mumbled, Well, I don't know. But I do know, his mother-in-law retorted. Anyone with half an eye would know. Well, it doesn't matter now, Lily put in pleasantly. We're to get a good house and an allowance, and that's everything, mother. Yes, that's the main thing, Dave said, and went off for a bucket of water. Sarah was the only one who disapproved of Dad building another house for Dave and Lily. I don't know what they want with a place like that, she said, 
when Dad at dinner one day was boasting of having let the contract for three hundred pounds. The one they're living in ought to be quite good enough for them. Mother made an effort to console Sarah, but Sarah was a hard girl to silence when she felt she had a grievance. I don't know, she sneered, tossing the spoons recklessly into the cups and making a lot of unnecessary noise with them. Some people seem to be able to get anything they want, while others can't get anything at all, no matter what they do for it. What's up with you? What the deuce do you want now? Dad said savagely. There's a great many things I want, but I don't seem to be able to get any of them. And Sarah flashed her eyes on Dad. Well, what in the devil are they? P plenty Here, Sarah broke into tears. I've not had it. <laughs> Sobbing. Decent dress that I could go out in and for, for, for I don't know when. God bless my soul, Dad roared. What the deuce do I know about your dress? Don't be silly, girl, Mother said, soothingly to Sarah. I'm a sa sa saddle. I've got to ro ro ride it. Go look at it. Go and get yourself a better one, then, Dad bellowed. Confound it, do you think I carry everything about in me pocket with me? Again, Mother pleaded with Sarah. Others can get houses, Sarah blubbered. And to the mischief with ya, Dad yelled desperately and jumped up and bolted from the table. In less than a week, the carpenters had the timber on the ground, and once more a new house was going up for Dave. Dad used to leave the yard or the paddock, or wherever he happened to be, about twenty times a day, and stroll up to see how the building was getting along. And he'd yarn and stare about, and examine nails and putty and things lying around, and get in the way of the men and keep them back. Oh, I used to do a bit of carpentering myself once. Dad said boastingly to the contractor one evening, and the contractor, a quiet man with hard, immovable features, said, Yes, I saw you putting up that place there. And he pointed with a chisel to Dave's little gunya. Oh, uh, yes, yes, quite so, quite so. Dad answered, colouring a little. But I only meant that one to stand till this one went up. Well, I think it'll do that, the contractor said quietly. Unless the wind happens to rise within the next few weeks. Then Dad cleared his throat and went away to attend to the cows. Dave's humpy was a subject which Dad didn't care to discuss much with strangers. Well, how are you enjoying yourself? Dad said cheerfully, saluting Mrs. White, who was standing in Dave's doorway one afternoon. Mrs. White nearly fell down with surprise, and before she could recover control of her feelings, Dad had invited her to come and look at the new building. Come on, he said. Come on, I want to show it to you. Mrs. White, in her haste to secure a hat, fouled Lily and knocked a dish of cream out of her hand and forgot to apologise or pick any of it up. I think you'll like it, Dad said proudly as they stepped across the grass. Tears came into Mrs. White's eyes and her breath seemed to leave her. Dad's magnanimity was too much for her. We are, he said, indicating the framework with a sweep of his hand. There's the bedroom and this here is where they'll eat. It'll be lovely, Mrs. White said, gazing round. And I'm sure they should be grateful to you, Mr. Rudd. So long as they're satisfied, Dad said in an off-handed sort of way. I am. Don't matter a straw to me. Then taking up the plans, he explained the architecture of the building in detail. And in the interests of convenience, Mrs. White suggested several alterations, all of which Dad, though he didn't exactly see the sense of them, readily accepted and he instructed the contractor to carry them out, and raised consultations and angry discussions amongst the men. When are you going away? Dad inquired, on taking leave of Mrs. White. Mrs. White thought she wouldn't be going home for a few days. Not till Saturday. Well, Dad said, come to the races with us tomorrow, and on Saturday morning I'll drive you to the railway station in the buggy. And that night, while Mrs. White at tea eulogised Dad to Dave and Lily, and said he was a fine old man, Dad, at our table, spoke of no one but Mrs. White. A splendid woman, he said. A woman of the world. A woman with a business head, believe me. End of section 8. End of Dave Brings Home a Wife by Steele Rudd.